deeper so that we can just have that settled foundation as to as to why we believe and uh, just the foundation that's being built that our faith rests upon and we thank you so much for that in jesus name we pray amen, amen. well we are in a series called apologetics and we're getting that from the greek word apologia out of first uh, peter three fifteen. That says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense <clears throat> to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we want to be able to tell other people why we're believers, why we believe what we believe. And so the word defense, the Greek behind it, apology, it means simply to give a, an answer or a reasoned statement as to why we believe what we believe. And that's good. It's good for us to be able to tell others and it's good for us ourselves to know um, that there are some pretty solid facts that our faith rests upon. We're going through Paul Little's book, Know Why You Believe, and he was a, a great uh, speaker on the Christian faith and, and uh, apologetics, the defense for the faith. And we're taking each of these chapters uh, and springboarding off of them as topics. And so here are the chapters of his book. We've looked at the first week, is Christianity rational? And we talked about faith. And he talked about how we have faith in, um, you know, even if you're not a believer in Jesus, you, you have faith or you put your trust in certain things like doctors and so forth. And so is it rational uh, to put your faith in Jesus and who he is? And then chapter two, is there a God? And we looked around at the world and uh, see that there is order and design in our universe in our world and also in our own bodies and it does argue definitely for something superior to us at the very minimum an intelligent designer and so we start looking to see who that intelligent designer might be so the chapter is there a god and then specifically uh, on jesus is christ god and we started looking at what the bible has to say about jesus is he just a man or is he more than a man and of course, from cover to cover, we see the deity of Christ. We see that he is more than a man, that he is in fact God. And that brings us to the chapter tonight, did Jesus rise from the dead? Okay. And so we're going to be looking at that. And before we do, I actually, you know, we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about, is there evidence for the resurrection? That's the topic tonight. Um, but I just kind of want to jump back again the last time we were together and just reinforce that Jesus actually did exist here 2,000 years ago. There's not many people, but the, there are some who would say, well, you know, it's even doubtful that he ever actually existed. And, and I just want to kind of put that one to rest because there's, as I shared last week in, in uh, just briefly, that, that there's plenty of testimony, um, both favorable and non-favorable testimony towards the, the historicity of Jesus. I like that word. Historicity. Historical authenticity is the, is the idea. There, there is historical evidence that Jesus actually existed. Uh, he was mentioned by secular authorities of the day. He was mentioned in Jewish writings and also, as you would expect, mentioned in Christian writings as well back in the first century and so forth. So I just want to um, put the list out there for you. It'll be on our website if you ever want to to take a look at it. And this is taken from Josh McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Verdict. So these are secular authorities. In other words, these are non-Christians. Um, these aren't Jewish uh, folks right here. Cornelius Tacitus, who lived AD 55 to 120, he was a Roman historian, spoke of Jesus. And there was a quote last time we were together uh, that I gave you uh, that he spoke of concerning Jesus and his disciples. Lucian of Samosata, these are harder than some of the Old Testament Bible names that you have to try and pronounce when you're going through that. Uh, second century Greek satirist, Suetonus, second century Roman historian, Pliny the Younger, is governor of Bithynia in AD 112, Thallus, first century historian, and Phlegon, second century historian, and Mara Bar Serapion, first century Syrian and Stoic philosopher, all refer to either Jesus or Jesus and his disciples. Uh, and again, <clears throat> it's not like they're favorable mentions, but they do mention them. And I think that's uh, the important thing to just see that they, and that's all we're looking at here with this, is that they were actual people of history. And there's Jewish references as well. The Babylonian Talmud, which is uh, 
the oral uh, traditions of the rabbis over the years uh, finally codified, finally written down. And so you have the law of Moses. We have the Bible. We have, we have the law that we see. And then you have the rabbis that are um, trying to define what that particular law means. And so that's the oral tradition, kind of like we would would sit around and talk about, well, what does this scripture mean? The, the rabbis, the authorities on that would say, well, this is what this particular law in the Bible means. And so that was the oral tradition. And of course, they would embellish upon that. And then there was commentary on the oral tradition. And this came together in what's referred to as the Talmud. And so in the Talmud, which was ultimately codified or, or written down uh, centuries after Jesus uh, it spoke of his crucifixion, it spoke of him and his disciples, and it spoke of the virgin birth, but again, not in a favorable way. In fact, the virgin birth, and I mentioned this, I think last time we were together too, was spoken of in a derogatory way. Like, we don't know who Jesus' father was. He's the virgin born or something like that. So in, in, a, in a very negative way. But again, the point being is that these are men of history that are being referred to, and we have the, the uh, historical evidence for that. Josephus, who was a first century uh, Jewish historian, wrote a lot about the events that took place in the first century and uh, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and mentions the disciples and mentions Jesus as well. And so these, the, the secular authorities, the Jewish references are what we would call non-favorable uh, authorities, which are actually a stronger witness for the historical authenticity of Jesus because they wouldn't try and be uh, laying down that he actually existed. Um, they wouldn't be favorable towards him. And again, as I mentioned, there are um, Christian testimony as well. And uh, actually, this is kind of interesting. Pre-New Testament creeds that speak of um, Jesus and his disciples. And it, it, as you read some commentaries, some scholars on the Bible, you'll see that within our Bible, they have what they believe are some creeds, uh, sayings that they had uh, prior to the Bible being written, which is kind of interesting. And I think we're going to be looking at one of those in just a moment. But, um, you know, sayings that, that, that they would have at that time that are quoted in the Bible that, again, would speak of Jesus, it would speak of his disciples as well. And let's not forget that we have the New Testament. I mean, the New Testament is a trustworthy document that tells us about Jesus and his disciples and who Jesus is and what he has done. The post-apostolic writers, these would be the generation that would come right on the heels of the apostles. So uh, the, the disciples, if you will, of the apostles, the ones that they would be mentoring and so forth. And so we have Clement of Rome and Ignatius and Quadratus, first century, all three of those, and then Justin Martyr in the second century. And so obviously these guys are writing about Jesus and his disciples, and again, a testimony here, and of course, these being favorable testimonies towards the historical authenticity that Jesus, in fact, existed. And then some additional sources for Christianity, and here are some Roman emperors, um, Trajan in the first century, Hadrian in the second century, Marcus Aurelius, a uh, third century Roman emperor, and then Juvenal and Seneca, uh, first century Roman poets and, and orators. So there is a lot uh, of evidence for the historical authenticity that Jesus actually existed as a person. And as Otto Bett said, no serious scholar has ventured to postulate the non-historicity of Jesus. So you might have heard someone say, well, we don't even know if Jesus really existed. No serious scholar would ever say that whether they're favorable towards Christianity or not, because there's just too much evidence that does speak that he actually existed. So he existed. Did he rise from the dead? That's the question that we have before us. And the resurrection is the foundation of Christianity. If there is no resurrection, we don't have any Christianity. And that is key. We have four gospels that specifically speak of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we have 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that speaks of the importance of the resurrection. If you think of what's the resurrection chapter, well, let me ask you this. If I say, what's the love chapter in the Bible, what would you say? 13. 13 what? First very good, very good. I know you had that. And if we said, what's the resurrection chapter? It would be 1 Corinthians 15, because here's where Paul is talking about the importance of the resurrection. And I'd like to start there. So if we could take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
we're going to look at why the resurrection is so important and what some believe uh, are one of the early New Testament creeds that the, the uh, early believers had at that time. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're just going to look at a few verses uh, and skim over some of this as we look at the foundation of Christianity. 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. So I declare to you the gospel, the good news. And this is probably the most succinct summary of the good news that we have. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And this is what's believed to be a New Testament early creed, that Jesus died for our sins as predicted in the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again. Again, the resurrection, key part of the gospel, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so here is presented the gospel as Paul is writing to the Corinthians, speaking about the importance of the resurrection. And he starts with the good news that Jesus died and that he rose from the dead. And he's going to go in to how important that is. But before he does that, the next thing he says is he was seen. And he starts saying, who saw Jesus after he rose from the dead? And so he speaks about Cephas or Peter. And he speaks about James, his uh, older or younger half-brother. He speaks about the uh, 11 disciples. And verse 6, it says, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. As he's saying Jesus was seen, notice what he's saying in verse 6, that Jesus appeared not to just Peter, and only Peter knew about it, or James, and only James knew about it, but over 500 at one time. And he also says that the greater part, which means more than half, are still alive. So in essence, what he's saying is you can go talk to an eyewitness that saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. So this is huge right here as he's stating this. It's huge because it's eyewitness testimony and it's something that, that couldn't be refuted. Uh, I mean, it's something as you, as you examine, as just you read through uh, the New Testament and the book of Acts, as they're preaching, and the central message that they're preaching is this right here, the gospel, that we need a savior. And Jesus died for us, the central message, he rose from the dead. And they're preaching that in the city that he died in. And, and nobody's standing around going, that's not true. He didn't rise from the dead. Says who? And, and what they would say is, says these 500 right here that are still alive and can testify to that. So this is, a, this is actually a, a huge thing as he starts this. So the gospel the resurrection being foundational, and that he was seen. And then we jump to verse 12 as he addresses the issue at hand. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So we can see that there was this current going through the Corinthian church, that there is no resurrection. And, and that's what he's going to make a point of. Because, you know, it'd be like somebody, I'm looking forward to when I'm going to live again. And somebody goes, no, you're not going to live again. There's no resurrection. And Paul's going to make a point of that in saying that, wait a minute. If you follow that to its end conclusion, if there's no resurrection, then Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then he isn't who he claimed to be. And if he isn't whom he claimed to be, then we're still stuck with our sin. That's the core thought through all of this. Again, in verse 12, if Christ has preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. 
For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, verse 17. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. That's the big thing right there. Jesus didn't rise. Your faith is worthless because he's not whom he claimed to be. And if he's not whom he claimed to be, then you're still stuck with your sin. And remember, it's your sin that separates you from God. So this is huge here. Verse 18, he continues on, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, meaning those who have died believing in Jesus, have perished. They died trusting in someone who wasn't the real deal. And so they're still accountable for their sin. And then verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we, Paul speaking here, we are of all men the most pitiable. Paul was persecuted from the day he became a believer until the day of his death. So yeah, I think he's saying, feel the sorriest for me. If in this life is my only hope and I get on the other side and I find out I was wrong, then, then feel bad for me. But verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead. <laughs> but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We used to trade off messages at the Ocotillo Wells Easter service, um, Pastor Van Frank from the Baptist Church and me. And, we, and oftentimes we did 1 Corinthians 15, and, and it was a dual message. One of us would go up and, and preach, if Christ is not risen, and then there would be a song or two after the message, and then the other one would come up and preach, but now Christ is risen. So it was like the ramifications if he didn't rise from the dead, and then the truth that he did rise from the dead. It was always great on the year that I would get the second one, because that's really where the good news is, you know. But the first one, you kind of shake things up. If, if he didn't rise, then he isn't whom he claimed to be, and that's the point that he's making through all of this. But he comes down to verse 20, not just making a statement, but again, that's what we're looking at tonight, is, is the evidence, just the logical evidence as we look at it for the resurrection that he did in fact rise. And as it says in verse 20, is the first fruits. And the idea is the first part of the harvest, the anticipation of a, a great harvest to come after that. He rose, and there's going to be a lot more that are going to rise as well. And that's the hope that we have, is that we're going to rise from the dead and that we're going to be with him. Now, if you brought your book out, let's, let's look at chapter four. And I just wanted to read a little bit uh, out of the book tonight from Know Why You Believe by Paul Little. Looking at page 60, page 60, just the first opening uh, page of chapter four that says, both friends and enemies of Christianity have recognized the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be the foundation stone of the faith. In the early church at Corinth, some were questioning, even denying the possibility of the resurrection of the dead. Hearing this, the Apostle Paul gave the astute summary statement, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith, 1 Corinthians 15, 14. With, the, with these few words, Paul soundly rested his whole case on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Either Jesus did or did not rise from the dead. If he did, it was the most sensational event in all of history and gives us conclusive answers to the most profound questions of our existence. Where have we come from? Why are we here? What is our future destiny? If Christ rose, we know with certainty that God exists, what he is like, and that he cares for each of us individually. The universe then takes on meaning and purpose, and we can experience the living God in contemporary life. These and many other life-expanding things are true if Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. And the key issue here with his resurrection is that he made some very direct statements. He had told his disciples that he was going to be delivered over to the Gentiles. He would be mocked, he would be killed, and on the third day he would rise again. And he said that a number of times to his disciples. So at the very least... If he didn't rise from the dead, then either he didn't know what he was talking about or he was lying to them, okay? The other thing that I think and I've always felt is, is really key in this is that when the religious authorities question him by what sign do you show us seeing how you do these things, the, the cleansing of the temple, 
the statements that he made, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin, that there's no other way to the Father except through him. And both times, Matthew 12 and John 2, he gave him the resurrection, whether it was Jonah and the great fish or whether it was destroy this temple and in three days I'll, I'll raise it again. So he rested. When you think about it, he rested everything he was saying and doing on the fact that he would rise again the third day. So if he didn't rise from the dead, then it, it means that he wasn't who he claimed to be. And there would be no reason for us to put our hope in him. That's why the resurrection is the foundation of Christianity. It, it's huge. And that's part of the reason we're looking at this tonight. Uh, did Christ rise from the dead? And I'm going to give you an outline here of where we're going for uh, the evidence of the resurrection. And we're going to look at the Christian church. The fact that we're meeting here tonight as an evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. We're going to look at Sunday worship. The fact that the animal sacrifices have ceased. We're going to speak of the New Testament. We're going to talk about the empty tomb. What are we going to do with a tomb that's empty? That's some pretty good evidence for the resurrection. And also the resurrection appearances that we've already touched on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, so that's where we're going tonight as we look at this. And you'll find much of this in the book and the chapter that uh, we're springboarding off of tonight. Christianity began around AD 32 in Jerusalem, the very city where Jesus was crucified. 50 days later, Peter is preaching the resurrection at the Feast of Pentecost. If you still have your Bibles open, Acts chapter 2 gives us Peter preaching to the multitudes. Now, this is about 50 days after Jesus was crucified, okay? So not yet two months after Jesus was crucified. What's one of the last things we remember about Peter? Remember, Peter is the one that was so famous, famously known for denying the Lord three times. He denied that he knew him in the face of what? A little handmaiden in the courtyard of the high priest. But now we see him. Now we see him in the face of those, the crowd. The same crowd, I think we could argue for, less than two months earlier, who were chanting, crucify him, crucify him. Okay, now Peter is there going, you're the one who crucified him. Something has changed inside of Peter to make him courageous. No longer a coward, but now, now courageous. In Acts chapter 2, as he's speaking to the multitudes that have gathered for the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 2, starting from verse 22, we see Peter say, men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, think about that for just a moment, as he's bringing up Jesus, that God attested to who he is by the miraculous. And then he says, you guys know these things. And they're not responding back. Uh-uh, we didn't know anything. They did. They knew of the miracles that Jesus did. It says in verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Remember, you guys, this is this was once the hostile mob that was there chanting, crucify him, crucify him. And Peter is saying, you, first of all, he says, this was God's plan from the beginning, the sovereignty of God, but he brings in the responsibility of man. You guys are the ones that delivered him up. And so you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. God raised him up. Now, what did the crowds do? Again, we got to think about this. This is less than two months after the crucifixion. So Jesus has died not, not even two months earlier. He's in the same city where he was crucified. And you have the multitudes around. And how do the multitudes respond when Peter says that Jesus rose from the dead? They don't go, no, that's not true. Uh-uh, we don't think. What did they do? They were convicted in their heart and 3,000 of them get saved. That's some pretty powerful proof that they knew something was going on. Nobody could rise up and go, well, that's not true. He didn't rise from the dead because he had appeared like we read in 1 Corinthians 15, to over 500 people. And at this time, they all would have still been alive because there's no Christian martyrs yet at this point. So they all could have stood up and said, we all saw him. 
And so the testimony that birthed the Christian church. And so we see the Christian church throughout the book of Acts beginning to gain steam and we see more and more people uh, become believers. In fact, it, it began to grow exponentially. And by the early fourth century, when the Roman emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, historians say there were around 30 million Christians at that time. How can you explain that? How can you explain that this group grew so big? I'm going to suggest to you that it's because Jesus rose from the dead, just like Peter said. And by the way, it was the central message of the early church as you read through the book of Acts. Again, the gospel in its succinct form is Jesus died and he rose again. And they're preaching that not in some other country, but they're preaching that right there in the same city where people could say, "Uh, uh-uh, that's not true. But they didn't do that. They were like, I need to get my life right with God. And witnesses uh, abounded to that. Uh, Josh McDowell, again, in a ready defense, he says, the message of a risen man could not have been maintained a moment in Jerusalem if the grave was still occupied. It just wouldn't fly. Turn back a page or two to Acts chapter 1. And notice how Acts chapter 1 begins. Acts chapter 1, beginning from verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Many infallible or unmistakable proofs that he in fact was alive. Again, not just to the disciples, but to 500 plus for a period of 40 days. He's showing himself. So there was no question as to whether he was alive from the dead or not. So the birth that we have here, the best explanation for the rise of the church is the resurrection of Jesus. Another thing to think about is the shift to Sunday worship. I think we all know that the Sabbath day is Saturday. As you read through the scriptures, you find that the the Sabbath day was to be the day that the children of Israel were not to rest. And, And initially, that's the idea. They were brought out of Egypt, and they'd been slaves for hundreds of years, and God made this law. And by the way, that's not a bad law, is it, to take one day out of seven and just rest a little bit because we rejuvenate. And we're able to get out there and, and uh, go for it again. This was a sign between God and the nation of Israel. And so they were to rest on the seventh day. Now, as we look, we find that over time, it had become a day where they weren't working, a day where they would go to synagogue and they would open up the scriptures and they would basically, they would worship God. It was a day set aside to worship God. That's what it had become. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have one day out of seven where we get together corporately and we we read the scriptures together and we worship God together. When the church started, we have to recognize this, the church started in Jerusalem with the disciples and and the 3000 that were saved in Acts chapter two. These people are Jewish that are getting saved. So when we look at the church today, I think most of us are probably Gentiles, not Jewish people, most of us probably. But at that time, almost exclusively Jewish, and yet they're shifting days that they're worshiping God. They're shifting from Saturday, and now Sunday is the day that they're worshiping God. How do you explain that? How do you explain the shift from one day to the next? Well, in the New Testament, we read about them meeting together on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. What happened to change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday? And I'm going to suggest to you that even though observing the Sabbath day, guys, was one of the Ten Commandments, you realize that? Make sure you observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What changed? Jesus rose on the first day of the week. So they decided to get together on the first day of the week and to worship him and to celebrate the resurrection. It's really the only answer for it when you think about it. And that brings us to our next point here is the animal sacrifices ceased. 
Now, with the animal sacrifices, admittedly, once the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD, there's no longer a temple to go to to offer the animals uh, as sacrifices. But what about that 38-year period after Jesus rose from the dead in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed? There's no longer animal sacrifice for the Christians taking place. And again, these are primarily Jewish people. This is what God had given to the Jewish people. In Leviticus 17.11, he gave the blood upon the altar to make atonement for the soul because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so the animal sacrifices were a covering. It was a covering so that they could have their lives right with God because of the sin that they had committed. But all of a sudden, there's no longer animal sacrifices. Why? I think the answer is what John the Baptist said of Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the sacrifice. He's the one who died. In fact, there's a passage in Hebrews chapter 10 that, that oftentimes I think is misinterpreted. But in Hebrews chapter 10, as the author is writing to a group of Jewish Christians who are considering going back to Judaism, going back to the law. The persecution so heavy by their Jewish brethren that they're thinking about leaving their faith in Jesus and going back to the sacrificial system. And the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 26, if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. If you leave Jesus and you go back to animal sacrifices, they don't count anymore is the idea. They don't count. Why? Because the Lamb of God has come. He has come as the sacrifice. So the animal sacrifices were pointing the way, but that, that came to an end when Jesus ushered in the new covenant. See, that's the thing. Remember at what we refer to as the Lord's Supper when he passed the cup around. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant, not the old covenant of animal sacrifices, but the new covenant of faith in Jesus that God predicted would come 600 years before. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. A new covenant I'm bringing. What for the church, for the Gentiles? No, a new covenant for the house of Israel and the house of Judah. How about that? Are the Gentiles included? Absolutely. But it was for his people that he began that. Isn't that neat? So Jesus ushered that in at Calvary. He ushered in the new covenant. So there's no way you could go back to the old covenant system because it's, it's really, it's no longer valid. It, it's faded away. And so the only way to have your life right with God is through faith in Jesus. And so another, another example of, of the resurrection that Jesus is the way. They're, they're shifting away from the old covenant and no longer worshiping on Saturday, no longer having animal sacrifices and uh, uh, trying to have their life right before God through that. And let's not forget the New Testament. You know, when I went through my window uh, of doubting, and like I mentioned when we first started this, I don't think there's anything wrong with doubting. Uh, as far as Christianity. Is this really real or not? I mean, should I really be believing that? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I went through my period of doubt after I was already a Christian. I, I think what's wrong is if you don't do anything with it. If you just doubt and go, oh, maybe it's not true, and then walk away. I mean, that's, to me, that's foolish because there's a lot of evidence, and, and it's worth looking into. And so uh, during my window, though, I, I, I don't want you to make the same mistake that I made. I was like, well, I don't want to look to the Bible because that looks like it's circular reasoning. I don't want to look to the Bible as any kind of proof for the existence of Jesus or, or the fact that he rose from the dead. I'm going to look at, at completely other sources. And, and you know, I, I went that route, but in, in the process, I found out that what we have before us is a trustworthy document. And, and we don't want to just throw that out because this, is, this has, and we're going to see this as we go through uh, these series of, of times together, we're going to see that there's a lot of manuscript evidence for, for the Word of God. We're going to see that there's a lot of reasons for us to trust the Bible as God's Word. Um, we have fulfilled prophecies here. That's really pretty big. And you have God in the, in, in the book of Isaiah saying, this is how you're going to know you're on the right track. I'm going to tell you things ahead of time. So he actually lays it out. How can we know if we're on the right track? He lets us know that. And we'll be looking at that as in upcoming weeks in, in, through the prophet Isaiah. This is how you're going to know that I'm God. 
is I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning. And, and let the other so-called gods do that. Let them predict the future. And that's what we have in the Bible. Hundreds of prophecies that speak of what's going to happen in the future. Hundreds of them already have been fulfilled. So we can look at that and go, wow, e either a really good guesser or what it really is, is it argues. It argues for the divine inspiration of scripture. It answers the question, was this written by men? Because, you know, I've heard people say that. You probably have too. That's what argues for the divine inspiration of Scripture. We also have, as we've already touched on, extra biblical writings. And, of course, that's where my focus was. Does anybody else speak about Jesus? Does anybody else speak about uh, him being the, the one that's the Savior of the world? And we've, we've touched on a, a little bit of, of that in the beginning of this study. Uh, the manuscript evidence, we'll look at that as time comes. And um, that's, what that's going to answer is the question, do, do we have the same book that was written down some 2,000 years ago? Because, you know, you've probably thought about that or heard that before, too. Well, it's been 2,000 years. Come on. It must have changed over the years. How can we say that this is the Word of God? Manuscript evidence will address that, and it will uh, attest to it more than any other book of antiquity. And so, there, again, there's good evidence that we have. And then, of course, archaeological discoveries. We'll be touching on that. And what does that do? That answers the myth question. Is this just made up fairy tales? Well, the archaeological discoveries show us that this book is speaking about real people that actually lived and, and real places that actually existed. So it, it argues for that. And so uh, point being, again, we don't want to throw out <laughs> the most detailed and most attested witness we have of the resurrection of Jesus, and that is the Word of God. I mean, we have got four Gospels that speak specifically to who he is, what he's done, and that he has uh, risen from the dead. Three of those are eyewitnesses. Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. John was one of Jesus' disciples. Mark is believed to be the eyewitness account of Peter as given to his young protege, young John Mark. And then, of course, Luke tells us that he gathered his information, even though he wasn't one of the disciples, he gathered his information from eyewitness accounts. And so we want to make sure we don't just do away with the New Testament. But we come to an empty tomb. What are we going to do about that? Again, Peter is in Jerusalem, not two months out of the crucifixion, and he's saying Jesus has risen from the dead. All the religious leaders would have to do is go to the tomb, get the body, and drag it out there, and it would totally silence him and totally put the growth of Christianity um, in the dirt. So, what about the empty tomb? Well, there's a couple of, well, there's a couple of theories as to what happened to the body. The one, actually the first one that was circulated, we find in the Bible in Matthew chapter 28, if you want to turn there. And it's the theory that the body was stolen. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 28, the women have come to the tomb. The angel has spoken to them. And then Jesus appears to them as they're going on their way. And then after that, in Matthew 28, beginning from verse 11, it says, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city. And this was the guard that was guarding the tomb. While the women were going away, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests, the religious leaders, all the things that had happened. Now, what had happened? The tomb's empty. The stone's been rolled away. They come in and they give this information, report it to the religious leaders. Verse 12, when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. So the religious leaders want the soldiers to say, well, we were asleep and the disciples came and stole the body away. Verse 14, and if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. You have to understand that this guard of Roman soldiers, it was their life if something happened. They were there to guard the tomb. There was a, a, a Roman seal that was put across the tomb, believed to be some kind of a rope that had um, clay on either side of it. 
that if anything happened and broke that, it was the guard's responsibility and they would pay for it with their life. So the religious leaders are saying, hey, if the governor finds out about it, we'll appease him. You just take this money. Verse 15, so they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. When you think about it and you think a Roman soldier who is trained to do his job is taking money to say that they were asleep when they could be put to death for it. Why would they do that? When you think about it, what else are they going to do? You know, there's no body there. What else are they going to do? And so this is the first thing that began to circulate, is that the disciples came and stole the body. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. Number one, the Roman soldiers sleeping, if they're going to pay with it for their lives, that, that's probably not going to happen. Number two, the stone, I, I mean, it's speculation, but the stone is believed to be like, like two tons. One person I read said, you know, it'd take 20 people to move that stone or that. In Mark chapter 16, the women are coming to the tomb. Remember what they're saying? Who's going to roll the stone away for us? So it was something at least that significant where that amount of, of ladies couldn't move the stone away. So the disciples, how are they going to come with the Roman soldiers guarding it, move the stone without them knowing, and steal the body of Jesus? And then the big question, why would they do it? Why would they steal the body of Jesus? Would they do it so they could go out and lie that he rose from the dead? Is that the character we see in the disciples as is reported to us in the gospels that they were liars? And, and the other thing, would they die for a lie? Would they die for a lie that they knew was a lie? That's the thing. There are people who die for lies. I think the Muslim terrorists are a good example of that. They're dying for something that's not true. But the disciples, if they're the ones that stole the body, they would know it's a lie. So it doesn't make any sense, really. Another theory is that the authorities are the ones that stole the body. But that doesn't make any sense either. Because the soldiers, they wouldn't risk their lives to do something like that. And the religious authorities, I mean, they, they would rather have the body. So that they could say, no, this thing of the resurrection is wrong. Here's the body right here. So the whole idea of the body being stolen isn't really a good theory. Another theory is that the women went to the wrong tomb. That the women, and, and you can imagine, they were distraught because Jesus had died. And so they went to the wrong tomb and his body wasn't there. But again, all the religious leaders would have to do is go to the right tomb and produce the body. Uh, surely Joseph of Arimathea knew which tomb was his. And I thought Paul Little brought out a neat idea as we think of a cemetery with a lot of tombs in it. And yet at that time, it wasn't like that. I mean, this was a tomb in a certain location. It wasn't a tomb among a lot of other tombs. And so uh, going to the wrong tomb, again, isn't a good theory. The swoon theory. The swoon theory is that Jesus did not actually die, but he just fainted when he was upon the cross. And when he was in the tomb, he revived and came back to life. Now, there's a couple of issues here. I mean, number one... Um, what he went through before he was on the cross, just, just to throw out the argument that he didn't die, what he went through, and um, Lee Strobel goes through this in his book, The Case for Christ, where he, he examines, or um, not examines, he interviews, I think it's a medical doctor, concerning the scourging and the crucifixion. And, and it's very detailed, but suffice it to say, uh, the, the scourge, leather whips with metal balls and bone fragments in them that would have bruised and just shredded from the back of the neck to the back of the calves. And many of the people that were scourged never made it to the cross. Many of them died because of the scourging. You remember Jesus, when he's on his way to the cross, they have to employ Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross because of what Jesus has already gone through. And then Lee Strobel, in talking with a medical doctor, he speaks about the nails that, that pierced through the upper palm, through his wrist, and would hit the nerve right there in both hands and the nerve through the feet. And you just think, and, and the point being here is how can you function after that? How could you possibly walk after you had a nail that was driven through the bottom of your legs like that? It, it, anyway, and then when they came to Jesus, and these are Roman soldiers who know what death looks like. They attested to the fact that he was dead. 
You remember, they wanted to get rid of the, the, the uh, victims on the cross because it was a high day. And so they went, they broke the legs of the first one because as they're hanging there, they would suffocate over time. They would push themselves up in order to be able to continue breathing. So they broke their legs so they could no longer lift themselves up. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. And again, they know what death looks like. It fulfills the prophecy that spoke, not a bone of his would be broken. But I think just to be sure, what did he do? He took the spear and it went into his side and out came blood and water, okay? So you've got, you've got all of that. And let's just say, okay, to me, it's a great testimony that he was actually dead. But let's just say, okay, let's say he fainted. Now he comes back to life in that condition in the tomb. Number one, how can he even walk? Number two, how's he gonna roll the stone away? And how's he going to overpower the guards or slip past the guards? And then, number three, is he going to come to his disciples and go, worship me as God? I mean, what kind of condition would he be in at that point? And yet, that's what they did. They worshiped him as one who was alive from the dead. And so the whole idea that, that he swooned and, and just came back to life just isn't plausible. But then again, the character of Jesus, if he did that, he would be lying, wouldn't he? And is that what we see in the character of Jesus? So the theories that are there concerning the empty tomb, they fall drastically short. The bottom line is the tomb is empty and Jesus is not there. And as the disciples, and this is the thing that we see that maybe it's, it's not apparent to us, but it's there. As the disciples preached, they were preaching to a group that were there just a few months earlier. And they weren't going, no, that's not true. I mean, there was, there was no empty two. And none of these things made any sense as far as what happened to the body. And then finally, we come to the resurrection appearances, as we've already looked in 1 Corinthians 15 and <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, as it spoke about Jesus showing himself by many infallible proofs and all the people that saw. And some people would try and explain it away as hallucinations. That people, you know, and, and, and this is the deal, you know, like if you've lost a loved one, maybe you would, you know, think, oh, I just, I think I saw him there because you miss them and you would want to see them. And, and for some people that they would expect that, but this is the key thing here. The disciples didn't expect Jesus to rise from the dead. They were surprised. You know, even though Jesus had told them, I'm going to be delivered of and be crucified, the third day I'll rise again, it didn't compute. They weren't expecting him to rise from the dead. And how can maybe one person have a hallucination, but how can over 500 people have the same hallucination at the same time? So that falls drastically short. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I wanted to point out as far as the appearances go is that these people's lives were changed. Remember Peter again, I mean, I hate to call him a coward, but he denied the Lord three times. And then all of a sudden something is different on the day of Pentecost. He is bold, he is powerful. I'm gonna to suggest to you there's two things that took place. Number one, he saw Jesus alive and it didn't matter to him anymore. My savior is alive and I know when I pass from this life, I'm gonna be with him. And the second thing is that now he is empowered by the Holy Spirit, yeah. So he goes forth in boldness with the message that he can verify as an eyewitness. So remember with the disciples as well though, I mean, they're threatened by the religious leaders. They were flogged. They were beaten. They were in prison. The religious leaders forbid the disciples to speak in the name of Jesus. What did the disciples do? They got right back up, went right back out, and they said, we must obey God rather than men. Amen. And so <clears throat> the disciples, this is another, the, the martyrs of the early church. This is another testimony, I think, to the resurrection of Jesus. There was something that changed their life. And as we take a look at the, at the martyrs, those who gave their life, historians like Josephus and Eusebius and others tell us that these men went to their graves one by one, suffering and dying painful deaths for their ongoing belief and preaching that Jesus was Lord and was risen from the dead. And here is a list. Matthew was slain with a sword in a city of Ethiopia. Mark died in Alexandria in northern Egypt after having been cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. Luke was hung upon an olive tree in the land of Greece. John was banished to the island of Patmos by which he received the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's the only one who didn't die a martyr's death, by the way. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think it's Fox's Book of Martyrs that, that speaks of him uh, having been boiled in oil, but it didn't do anything to him. 
and then he was banished to the island of Patmos. But uh, James, brother of John, was beheaded in Jerusalem. James the Less, as he's called in Mark 1540, was thrown from a pinnacle of the temple. Philip was hung up against a pillar at Hierapolis in the province of Phrygia. Bartholomew was filleted alive. Andrew was bound to a cross and left to die. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Um, Matthias, the apostle that was chosen to replace Judas, was first stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death by the Jews at Salonica. Paul, after a variety of tortures and imprisonment, was finally beheaded in Rome. Thomas was run through the body with a spear in East India. And Peter, because he didn't feel worthy to die the way his Lord died, was crucified upside down in Rome. Now, these are the people that are willing to lay their lives down for what they believed to be true, what they knew to be true as an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there are those that will die unknowingly for a lie, but there are not many who will die knowingly for a lie. And you have every single one of them that laid their life down. To me, it's a powerful testimony of the resurrection of Jesus. Conclude us with this. This is out of um, Josh McDowell's evidence that demands a verdict. As G.B. Hardy has said, here is the complete record. Confucius' tomb is occupied, Buddha's tomb is occupied, Muhammad's tomb is occupied, Jesus' tomb is empty. The verdict is in, the decision is clear, the evidence speaks for itself, it says very clearly, Christ is risen indeed. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 Let's pray, and we'll open it up. Lord, thank you for what you've left us. Thank you for uh, the truth of your word, and thank you for the power of the resurrection that brings such validity to who you are. And thank you for the hope that it brings us as well. Lord, we're just, we're thrilled to be followers of you. We're just thrilled of who you are and, and um, what you've done and that death cannot hold you, nothing can hold you down. And that we recognize that we are victorious because of you. And um, we look forward to that day where we will rise again as well. And most importantly, just to rise to see you face to face and to be with you forever and ever. And until that day comes, I just pray that, again, you would use us, work through us like you worked through Peter and the apostles by the power of your Holy Spirit to proclaim your truth through our words and through our lives to let people know that you love them, and that you died for them, and that you're waiting for them. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.